Okay, turn around and high five someone that you woke up and you're here, yes? Just high five somebody. Because that was an accomplishment, my friends. I respect that. <laughs> Good work. So here's the deal. I know that you're dying and you're really tired and I respect it. I know that you're tired, but here's the deal. I want you to take this talk. I want you to take this 20 minutes and I want you to put it somewhere deep in your heart because you're gonna have a day in the next two weeks where you're gonna be like, what did that chick say? I need that, right? So put it somewhere deep in your heart. I know you're tired, but just stick with me for like 20 minutes because I just want to give you some love. I wanna give you some love. And I want to ask you if you know my friend here. I have a friend. Um, do you guys know this guy? This is my slide. Do you guys know this guy? Yeah. So I kind of have, do you guys, anybody have saint crushes? Saint crushes? Yeah? Okay. He's my, like, hardcore saint crush, right? He's like the Catholic homecoming king. Too good to be true, but he was. Yes? If you don't know St. John Paul II, St. John Paul the Great, get to know him, okay? I wish I could give a whole four-hour talk on his life. Um, but I'm so obsessed with him. My husband knows. It's fine. He's, uh, he's actually more obsessed than I am. It's, it's a family thing, right? So um, I'm so obsessed with him that I actually just named my fifth baby after him. So this is John Paul Swafford. Um, no, his name, our baby, he's John Paul Benedict Swafford. No pressure, right? So this is my baby. Um, and this is my family. Like I said, it's a joint obsession. So um, we all love him. This is Pope. If you don't, like I said, St. Saint, Saint John Paul the Great is just amazing. And I want you to just take a look at his face here. Because like I told you, he's just cool, right? The man is just exude. He exuded holiness and just cool. Anybody who can pull off those shades, right? Like, hi. Okay. Um, so here's the deal. I want to tell you a story about uh, something that happened in our church in 1993. I know you weren't alive, some of you were, um, but it was World Youth Day 93. Pope John Paul II had a huge love for the youth. He loved the youth. And so he started a thing called World Youth Day, and he would have them all over the country, all over the world. And he looked at his, his people, and he says, I want to do one in America. And they looked back at him, and he, they were like, Holy Father, that's not a good idea. Like, they're not really into, like, the whole God thing. They don't really do, like, youth ministry. Like, they don't really care. The youth don't care. The bishops from America were like, Holy Father, Please don't embarrass us and don't embarrass yourself when nobody comes. And he looked him in the eye and he said, I believe in them. I want one in America. And so they chose Denver. And, at, you know, Denver is, you know, maybe not the most, you know, religious place, right? And so he's like, they're like, Holy Father, Denver, really? Are you sure? Right? Why not Homa? Right? So here's the deal. So they, they, they chose Denver. And they're like, Holy Father, he's not, they're not going to come. And he's like, Denver. And I don't, I don't think I would ever tell the man no. So I, they were like, yes, Holy Father, check, right? So they, they had this in Denver, and they, they were hoping that, like, 40,000 people would show up. Registrations came in at 200,000. They had, I know, right? Mile High Stadium was full to capacity. They had 90,000 people in, Aero, in, in Mile High Stadium, right? One of my favorite stories from this day is the Pope was flying in, and he could see like the whole stadium packed, the whole parking lot packed, right? There was people like flowing into the streets because they couldn't get in. They just wanted to be close. And all of a sudden, the helicopter came flying in with the Pope in it, right? So people are going like nuts, right? Like there's like crazy and then there's like cray cray, right? Like it was like off the charts. The, the guy that was flying the helicopter, he was a, a war veteran. A, he flew choppers in Vietnam and he was flying over and he... The, the whole helicopter started bobbing up and down from the noise, and they had to make an announcement to please, if everyone could be quiet, because they can't safely land the helicopter. Let's not kill the Pope, right? Like, so here comes the helicopter. It's flying in. It's, like, bobbing, right, and weaving. So the entire place, all of Mile High, all 90,000, go dead silent. And the helicopter lands in the middle of the 50-yard of, of the line, and the door opens, and John Paul II took one step off of that and the place erupted and I will tell you right now something happened in our church that day because people in that stadium will tell you that their life was forever changed by this this man in a cute little white dress just getting off this plane right the the, the priest that married me was heard his vocation in that stadium so many of my mentors were in that stadium and came back and started focus and started all these things in our church. Something happened that day. And then here comes, you know, I, this man, like I said, obsessed. I was 16. 
he came back to America in 1999. And he went to St. Louis. And I was 16. I was sitting, I was seriously right where you guys were. And we didn't have a youth group. I'm come from a very small, I graduated with 18 people in my class. I'm from Kansas, remember? There's more cows than people, okay, good. So I graduated with 18 in my class, and we didn't have youth ministry. My mom took me to NCYC one time. It was awesome, but, like, we didn't really have, like, Again, my mom took me to, okay, good. So here we go. So I didn't really know what this whole thing was about, right? This is early in my life of faith. And the f- neighboring youth group had a couple guys that were really cute. And they were like, hey, we're going to St. Louis to, like, see the Pope. And I was like, what? Okay. Um, and they're like, out of school a couple days, you want to come? I'm like, I'm not going to tell you no, right? So I'm like, yeah, like, absolutely. So I get on this bus, and we go to St. Louis. And I honestly didn't know what was about to happen, right? So we get there. I was truthfully, I was there for DC Talk. Um, you guys don't know who that is, all the chaperones, yeah. Um, everybody so you're with me, uh, Toby Mack was a part of DC Talk. Okay, good, we're all together. Okay, good. So here's the thing. I'm there for DC Talk. The Pope was late because of traffic. So we're all in this arena, again, packed house. I'm just standing there between the two, two cute guys like, this is crazy. It was like so loud. I was like, I did not really know why this was important, right? And all of a sudden he was late, like an hour late. So DC Talk's doing their best to entertain everybody. There's cardinals, like, doing the wave. That was, like, one of my awesome, like, all the bishops and cardinals doing the wave. I'm like, this is great. And then all of a sudden, the, the, they announced that the car, that the Pope Mobile is here. And the place just, like, got really, like, excited. You could hear people getting really nervous. And then all of a sudden, this little, this man in this, this white, all white just walks on stage. And you guys, I was screaming so loud, I couldn't hear myself scream. That's how loud it was. And I just broke down into tears. And I looked at the two guys next to me, and they were, like, bawling. And I was like, what is it about this man? Right? And I looked at my friend Nate next to me, and I looked at him, and I said, I don't know what just happened, but I will be Catholic till the day I die. And that was big for me because I was about to walk away from the faith because I couldn't answer the objections. I couldn't do those things. And I, I just, I, my, I, had a, I had a lot of Protestant friends, and they would badger me, and they would ask me things, and I just felt like I didn't know my faith and I was, I was scared, right? And one of the things he said that day on that stage was, be not afraid. And you know when sometimes you feel like someone's, like, talking to you, you're like, oh, shoot. Like, you know what I mean? You could feel that from stage. I love this slide. This is the be not afraid slide. This is in his handwriting. This is John Paul II's handwriting, and he wrote, be not afraid. And I know you're sitting in this chair right now, and you're tired, and you're, you know, you're exhausted, and we threw a lot at you, and the Holy Spirit just dumped a lot on you last night, right? Like, you're feeling it. But I don't know what it is in your heart that you're afraid of, but I'm going to bet that there might be some fear walking out of here. Like, what comes next? Like, what's going to happen next? And it reminds me of when I got back to my, you know, you get on that high, right? Like, I was on the JP2 high, and I came back, and I was like, my life is going to change forever. I was talking a big game. You know what I mean? Like, here we go. And then, like, the months go on, and what the words that kept coming back to me were, be not afraid. And it hit me one day, and it was really hard because I knew it was truth. But I felt the Lord saying, you're afraid Sarah, you're afraid to be seen with me, and you're afraid to be seen by me. I was afraid to be seen with the Lord. I was afraid to be seen with him. Sports are my God. Image was my God. Popularity, trying to make it. That was my God. That fed all my energy. And anything that messed with that was scary. Because I worked so hard. I don't know if you guys feel that way. But, like, I was afraid to be seen with him. And even more so, I was afraid to be seen by him because I was afraid that he wasn't, it wasn't going to be enough. And I kept him at a distance. Fear is real. I don't know what you're feeling right now. But as a high schooler, I know that it's hard to take everything that we're saying and be like, yeah, game on. I'm here. Let's go. I'm going to change everything about my life overnight. It's going to be amazing. Like, even if you have that intention, there's still that fear of what am I going to lose if I do this? That is real. And I know you might be feeling that. I felt it many times. And it reminds me of the apostles. Do you guys, bring me back to the apostles. These dudes, right? Follow Jesus. Anywhere you go, man, I am with you. Let's go. We're talking a big game, right? Good Friday happens. They arrest Jesus. They beat him. They scourge him. They put him on a cross. What did those men do? Jesus, I am with you. I am here. I will follow you to the ends of the earth. Like, I'm the 12. We're the 12. Like, we are in. What did they do? They ran. They hid. They were out. I thought I saw you with that Jesus guy. Not me. No, no, no. Like, hiding. 
Fast forward, Jesus rises from the dead. They're hiding in the upper room. He walks through the wall. Hey, fellas. If I was an apostle, I'd be like, what the heck, right? 40 days he spends with them. And then all, like, what do, you guys know the story, right? They go to the ends of the earth preaching the gospel. The same men, check this out, check these slides out. St. Peter went to Judea, Antioch, Rome, crucified upside down by Nero. St. Andrew went to Turkey, Macedonia, Greece, whipped and crucified on an X-shaped cross. St. James the Greater went to Spain and was beheaded. St. John went to Asia Minor, Rome, Ephesus. He was thrown into boiling oil and survived. He was exiled and died of natural causes. St. Thomas went to China and India and was stabbed to death. St. James the Lesser went to Jerusalem and was thrown from the temple wall, stoned and clubbed to death. St. Philip went to Greece and Syria and Turkey and was crucified upside down. St. Bartholomew went to Asia and Turkey and Armenia and was skinned and whipped and beheaded. St. Matthew went to Africa and Macedonia and Syria and was tortured and burnt alive. St. Simon went to North Africa, Egypt, the Middle East and was sawed in half. St. Jude Thaddeus was, went to Jordan, Libya, middle, all the Middle East and was sawed in half with St. Simon. St. Matthias went to Ethiopia, the Caspian Sea, and present-day Russia, Russia, and was stoned and beheaded. I bring this to you because I have a question for you. And that question is, what took those men from hiding to going to their deaths without fear? It was said that St. Andrew hung on an X-shaped cross for three days preaching the gospel. Long have I waited for the day that I could die a death worthy of my teacher and preacher. Oh, happy death. What, what happened? I have one, it is one word. And that one word is Pentecost. Jesus comes, rises from the dead, comes to them. Spends 40 days with them and is like, hey guys, love you. You're great. You're ready for this. And I have to go. If I was, if I were the apostles, I'd be like, no. No, Jesus, that's not a great idea. It didn't go so well the last time, right? Like, if you could just stick around, like, that'd be great, right? He's like, no, I have to go. And he goes, because I have to go because if I don't go, I can't send the advocate. I want to give you something that can, you can take to the ends of the world. Jesus couldn't go to all of those countries with each one of them, amen? So he sent the Holy Spirit upon them and sent them out to the ends of the earth. My friends, I want you to put this somewhere very deep in your heart. The same Holy Spirit that fell upon those men in the upper room at Pentecost is the same Holy Spirit that falls upon you right now. That is real. The Holy Spirit comes to you right now in power. Check out this Bible verse. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. My question to you, my friends in Homa, if not you, then who? I believe in you just as much, if not more, than St. John Paul II believed in you. I believe in you. The world tells you that you can't make a difference. You can't make an impact. You're just one person. Bull. I am so proud of you. Christ instituted the church, gave us the Holy Spirit, and said, be my witnesses. Be my hands and my feet. You guys, if you don't remember anything else from this weekend, remember the fact that the church loves you and the church needs you. I need you. And I need you just the way you are. I told the girls yesterday, right? God loves you just the way you are, but too much to leave you that way, right? Like, he wants you to serve the church now. Not when you're like 22 and have it all figured out. Or not when you're like 35 and you're like, mm, maybe I can do this. Now. He needs you desperately. We need you desperately. And that's why I know that there might be fear and it's not going to be easy. So how do we do it? I have a slide for you. Jesus gives us himself through the sacraments and through each other. He gives us the sacraments of initiation, baptism, the Eucharist, confirmation, the sacraments of healing through reconciliation, anointing of the sick, and sacraments of mission through marriage or holy orders. You guys, here's the deal. The church is not here to ruin your life and take away your fun, yo. I mean, I just need you to hear that really loud and clear. The church has a plan for your life, a blueprint. Do you guys ever feel lost sometimes? Do you guys ever feel like... I mean, I don't know if you guys feel that way, but I a lot of times was like, what am I, like, I want this, but I don't know what to do practically. Do you guys ever feel that way? Like, that's how I want to end this talk is like practically. He's given us the blueprint. He's given us the sacraments. Plug into the source. You guys plugged into the source this weekend, right? The Eucharist, confession, the sacraments, right? 
Don't unplug and go home and be like, I can do this. No, you can't. You have to plug back in. How many of you have ever um, had your phone die and you thought that you were going to die yourself, right? Like when your phone dies, you're just like, I, I, how am I going to find, I, I don't know where to go. I have no directions. Like someone's trying to find me right now and I'm not findable, right? Like, like when you let your phone die, it's like desperation. Don't let your spiritual phone die, right? Like don't let your spiritual life die. Plug into the source. And then I want to end this talk on, you guys, we need each other. The God, like God gave us the gift of the church and the gift of each other to get through this, to make it, right? Here's the deal. I want to leave you with some practicals. Um, a, like a few years ago, when I, like back when I started doing ministry, when I was in college, I don't know if you guys ever feel this way, but we, like, I knew everything I didn't want. I knew everything that had hurt me. I knew everything that was, made me empty. But I didn't know how, like, what I was actually supposed to be doing with my life. I don't know if you feel that way. Like, taking this home, if we just, like, feel like, yay, go team, go get him, Tiger. You know, it's like, okay, what am I supposed to do? And so one night, a bunch of my girlfriends and I got really bold. And we went up to a group of my guy friends. And we were like, like, what is, like, what is the most attractive thing about a woman? Like, what is it about, like, what do you want? What are you looking for? Right? Because we kind of felt like we were running around doing all kinds of crazy things. But we were like, what are we actually supposed to be doing with our lives? Like, faith, plugging into the source, praying, like, all this stuff. We're like, yeah, but, like, how do we practically live this out, right? And so we went up to our group of guys and we asked them this question. And they got into a man huddle. Have you guys all seen a man huddle? Right? Where, like, guys get together and they, like, put their arms around each other and they, like, sway back and forth like this. And there's typically grunting. Right? And so they're over in the corner just, like, grunting. And it's like, yeah. And they're talking and they're like, Okay, we got it, we got it, we got it, we got it, we got it. And they break huddle all John Wayne. They're like, we're back. And I was, we were like, okay, like, yeah, like, the most attractive thing about a woman, like, let's go, like, yeah. And they looked at us, and they said, holiness and confidence. And we were like, I'm sorry, come again. And they said, holiness and confidence. And they said, even guys that aren't into their faith would say they want a girl who knows who she is and does the right thing. And we were like, wow. That is deep. Thank you. Right? And it was the most awkward exit of a building of all time. We just left. We were like, wow. Thank you. Wow. So good. All right? And we just left. And so we got back to my apartment. One of my friends, like, threw a coat down. She's like, why do we even ask? We don't even know what that means. Like, just go be holding com confidence. Like, yeah, watch me frolic. Here I go. Like, yeah. I was like, I got nothing. Right? So we went back to the guys and we're like, hi. We're going to need some practical tips and tools on how to, like, execute this because we have no clue what you're talking about. We all thought we had to like dye our hair and lose 10 pounds. So like this is proving to be a little bit more difficult. So we went to them and we were like, what exactly do you mean by this? And they busted out a napkin, okay? And they started writing down like these traits, these characteristics, aka these virtues of this, of like this woman. And we're like, ooh, this is good. Keep doing that. That's good. And so us girls went and we made the simply irresistible virtuous man list, right? So we started like writing down these virtues for the men. And then we got together one night and we presented these lists to each other. And I bring this to you because it has been so meaningful in my life because it helped me so much to see, like, what the heck am I supposed to be doing in my life? And I've been, I've been showing this to people for years, and they all look at me like, dang, like, finally, I, I know what I'm maybe, like, supposed to be, like, striving for. You know what I mean? And so we got together and we, like, gave these lists to each other. And our, the guys, theirs was on a napkin, and ours was in Excel color-coded because men and women are different, equal but different, yes? And so we got together and had this, like, amazing conversation. So I brought these lists with me because I want to share them with you in this talk because it's practicals. You guys know, like, everything, add this to everything we've said this weekend on, like, how do we attack this, right? This is, ladies first, this is what the men wrote for the women. I've been asking people for years and making these lists. So this is what the men said for the women. She's gentle and kind, graceful and sincere, patient and flexible, doesn't gossip, isn't rude, tries to eliminate drama, not create it, poised and modest, open to the needs of others, nurturing and welcoming, joyful and fun. She stands up for what is right and seeks the truth. She has courage and is not afraid to confront and help someone. She's genuinely excited for another, not jealous or vain. She speaks with conviction. She's responsible, prudent, humble, and honest. She's secure. She's sensitive to the needs of others. Her relationship with God comes first in her life. She puts others first before herself. She strives for excellence in all things, in chastity and sobriety, and tries her hardest in academics or her career. She's not led solely by her emotions and passions. She maintains balance and order in her life. She lives a life of charity and service. She's forgiving, trustworthy, loyal, and pure. All the ladies in the house, take a deep breath in and let it out. Okay, ladies, repeat after me. Striving. Striving. 
not perfect, because perfect doesn't exist. Striving. Deep breath in and let it out. Good. Fellas, just so you know, I just completely overwhelmed every woman in this room, right? Because we don't look at lists like this and go, oh, my gosh, I want to be here. We look at lists like that and we're like, I'm not that. I'm not that. I messed that up at breakfast, right? Like, I'm not that. I'm not that. I just need a nap, right? And a box of Oreos while you're at it, right? Like, ladies, striving. That's, I, guys come up to me all the time. They're like, you know what's trippy about your list? What's so attractive about her is her act of striving for it. Like, not that she is, but her, like, striving for it. Trying just became attractive, ladies. Put that somewhere deep, yeah? Do you guys see what I'm saying? Like, this is so good. Fellas, is, is, was, is that woman attractive? Ayo. I heard whistling. Yes, yes, yes. I love it. Um, so, ladies, do you want to see the Simply Irresistible Virtuous Man, right, with... Yeah, people are always like, the girls are always like, put up the list. The guys are always like, or not. Is this going to be painful, right? Like, fellas, I'm with you, right? I'm with you. Again, this is what women of all ages, like, I, I would just ask everybody. I'd ask priests. I'd ask religious. I'd ask married people. I'd ask my grandparents, like, what do you think should be on this list, right? These are just, these are virtues, you guys. This is just living well, yeah? Make it look, like, live in virtue. Virtue is this word that's, like, locked in a vault with Jane Austen, and I want to free it. Right? Like, it's just this, like, word that I want to give to you for to give you power as you walk back into this world. Like, what am I supposed to be doing? So this is what the women said for the men. This was the list. He's a leader, provider, protector, initiator. He's chivalrous, brave and courageous, gentle and respectful, intuitive and patient, joyful and fun. He stands up for what is right and seeks the truth. He has courage and is not afraid to confront and help someone. He's genuinely excited for another, not jealous or vain. He speaks with conviction. He's responsible, prudent, humble, and honest. He's secure. He's sensitive to the needs of others. His relationship with God comes first in his life. He puts others first before himself. He strives for excellence in all things, in chastity and sobriety, and tries his hardest in academics or his career. He's not led solely by his emotions and passions. He maintains balance and order in his life. He lives a life of charity and service. He's forgiving, trustworthy, loyal, and pure. All the men in the house, just shrug your shoulders and be like, I'm all right. I'm all right, I'm all right, I'm all right, right? Like, I won't make you deep breathe, but repeat after me, men. Striving. Striving. Not perfect. Because perfect doesn't exist. Striving. All the women are like, there's something just attractive about them saying it. Gosh, right? Like, <clears throat> my goodness, striving. It's a good word. Yes? Everybody together here. It's good, for the, it's good for the men to say striving. Ladies, it's even probably better for you to hear them say it because they just found out about the list like two seconds ago. You have to give them a chance, okay? Right, fellas? Everyone's like, preach that woman. Yes, get it, right? Like, look, we're all a bunch of train wrecks. These lists are not easy, right? This is very important for you guys to hear. That's my list. The team, we're all striving. It doesn't matter. This, these are classy, man, right? This is classy. If you, did, if you noticed up there, not a single thing on there can be photoshopped. Not a single on, thing on there has anything to do with the way you look. No number on a scale, no number on a weight machine, nothing. It is beauty and it is truth and it is confident it's, and it is dignity and it is gorgeous. And that, my friends, is how you be a light to the world. We spend so much time worried about how we look and how we present ourselves and if we're enough and if we're making it and if we're going to make the team. I wish that I could have gone back to high school and someone would have handed me that list and been like, game plan, yo, game plan, plug into the source, live it out. And here's the deal. You can't do it alone. I talked to the ladies about a Strive Tribe, right? Ladies, find each other, right? Get a hashtag and a T-shirt, right, and, like, come together. Here's the thing, invite people into that. Raise your hand if you've ever felt alone. Okay, everybody look around now. Okay, good. I'm on a personal, personal mission to make sure that people never feel alone again. It might be the worst feeling ever. There's at least one or two people in your life that you wish were here this weekend because you're going to have a heck of a hard time telling them what happened. Yes? Invite them into this. Someone needs you, and you need someone, Yeah? A quick note to the men, all the fellas in the house. I'm up here 
in gold heels, and I will get on my knees, and I will beg the men in this room, I need your help. I need you men to come together in brotherhood. Brian killed it yesterday. You know what I'm talking about. I have lines and lines of women that come to me that are like, where are the men going to come from? And I told you, Homa, right? Like, they're coming from Homa. They're coming from Steubenville, yes? But I need you guys in this moment. I need you to create this brotherhood. There is a huge difference between a bro and a brother. A bro is someone you party with. A brother is someone you invest in. And I need you to find some brothers in your life, yes? Because the women need you. The women in this room need you. In Genesis, it talks about how God created man, and then he creates woman from his rib. Why the rib? Why not like the like pinky toe or like the wrist or like what, like pick a different, like no, he wanted the rib. Why? He took Eve from the rib because that's where God has always wanted woman. By the man's side, under his arm, and close to his heart. Right beside him. The women in this room want to run with you. They want to be led by you. But they have to be able to trust you, men. And you will never find your worth or identity, men, in the eyes of another human being. But you will find that brotherhood to be something that is going to take you into this, I mean, into this story, into this life like nothing else. Both of you, men and women, I need you to, ladies, find your ladies. Men, find the men. Run. Run together. There are three ingredients that make an amazing friendship. And you're going to hate me when I say them. You ready? Availability, vulnerability, and accountability. Availability, vulnerability, and accountability. Everyone's like, shoot me now, right? Like, nobody likes any of the three of those, right? Like, let's pick a different path, right? No, availability. The greatest gift you could give someone right now is the gift of your eyeballs. To put your phone down and say, I'm here for you. What's going on in your life? I'm, I'm, I'm here to listen. That's not always easy, right? The ladies are like, preach, right? The men are like, we talk to each other? Yeah, we should talk to each other. Okay, good. Vulnerability, right? It's not are you struggling. It's what are you struggling with? Pick a virtue, yeah? You guys, everyone is a hot mess. Everyone is struggling with something. It might not be your battle, but everyone has a battle. So be kind, yeah? Vulnerability, be real. And then accountability, which is like, oh, please, no, right? You guys all have these cards on your, on your chair, right? The greatest thing you can do this weekend is to write down who your accountability partner is. And I know this is going to be hard, but you're like, Sarah, like, I'm trying to rock this life and be perfect. Why would I open up about my weaknesses? Why would I open up about my sins? Why would I open up about what I'm struggling with? I'm trying to, like, make this look good, Sarah. Why would I open up about that? I'm going to tell you a story that I think embodies this perfectly. A few years back, I had a group of six guys come over to my house. And um, I'm, I, I'm at Benedictine, and I had these guys come over, <laughs> that's right. Um, so I live across the street from 2,000 college students. And I had give talks on campus, and these guys came over, and um, they were like, hey, we just need to talk to you. I, we just want to tell you something. And I was like, okay. So Swaff and I were sitting there, and they were like, about six months ago, you gave that talk. And I said, yeah. And they were like, that night we went home, we went back, and we all got together. There were six of them, and they were like, we just sat down and we just got really real. And we, each of us confessed and like talked about how each one of us was struggling with some type of, some type of sexual sin, whether it was like pornography or masturbation or sleeping around, like sleeping with a girlfriend, whatever. They just like said it out loud and told each other the struggle. And they decided to get together that night, and they started a text chain, and each one of those men on that text chain made a commitment. And the commitment was this, if any one of the men in that group fell, they would put out a text. And from that moment on, for 24 hours, none of the six of them would eat. They would fast for each other and they would pray for each other. And the reason for that was, was because they said, I needed someone that knew what was going on in my life so that I could go to a decision I could go to that stash, I could go to my phone, I could go to my girlfriend, and I would have to make a decision in that moment whether it was worth me and my five best friends not eating for 24 hours. I had to make a decision on whether or not I was going to be held accountable for this action that I thought nobody else knew about, but I made a commitment to these guys. And every single one of those six guys in that room couldn't tell me this story without crying because of how much this group meant to them. 
these brothers and how much they've grown in their relationship with God and in their relationship with each other. Who do you think were the best men in their weddings? Who do you think were the men that they went to when times got hard? If you can share that, what can't you share? Those six guys, what do you think, how do you think the women they married feel about the other men in that group? And the one amazing priest, right? Those men change their lives through accountability. I don't know what your struggle is, but I want you to take that story and I want you to take it to your tribe, take it to your group, take it to your crew, take it to whatever, take it to your brotherhood and make that real, whatever that looks like for you, whatever, this, whatever the sacrifice, whatever the fast, whatever, like make it yours. But I want you to have that relationship because that's where relationships grow is through availability, vulnerability, and accountability. They plugged into the source. They plugged into each other. And they're out changing the church right now as men of God. And I'm so unbelievably proud of them. And that's what I mean when I say that I need you. Like, men, I need you. I need you to take this weekend seriously. I need you to go back to your youth group and be like, okay, what, that, that was legit. Like, I want to run. Because if one of you says it, five other guys will be like, I'm in. I just didn't want to say it first. And then you run, right? I want your youth group to be different. And I want you to go invite that person, that one person that's on your heart right now that you know needs this and needs our Lord desperately. And the last thing I'll say is this. Be not afraid. I, I struggle with anxiety all my life. And I join you in this to be able to look to the Lord and say, be not afraid. The church needs you. I need you. And I don't want you to walk into this with fear. And this morning, I know that a lot of you are tired. And it's like, this is just kind of like the end of it. Like, thank yous, like, you know, all that. But like, I actually want this to be like the capstone of this conference. Because we've given you everything we have. And now we want you to take that and make it real and take it out. And you're going to need the Holy Spirit to do that. That same Holy Spirit that falls upon the apostles and changes their lives and takes them to their death. You guys, God might not be calling you to... A, a, what we call a red martyrdom. You might not have to shed blood, right? But I promise you that if you want to live for the Lord, you're going to have to die to yourself. And again, I said it. What was my greatest fear in high school? Was that I was going to lose who I am. That what was I going to lose in the eyes of the world? Like, is it, is it worth it? I don't know. I was rocking that life, right? And the question I didn't ask in high school was what am I going to gain? You have no idea the plans the Lord has for you in your life. Freedom, joy, peace that the world cannot give. And so I don't know what you're afraid of, but I have a prayer that I pray every morning. It's called the litany of trust. I pray it every morning, and I want to read through it with you. I want to pray through it with you as we enter into this time of prayer. And I want you to cry out to God for whatever it is that you're most afraid of. So open your hands. This is for you. Take this in. As I read it slowly, take it in slowly. And give all of this to the Lord. From the belief that I have to earn your love, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear that I am unlovable, deliver me, Jesus. From the false security that I have what it takes, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear that trusting you will leave me more destitute, deliver me, Jesus. From all suspicion of your words and promises, deliver me, Jesus. From the rebellion against childlike dependency on you, deliver me, Jesus. From refusals and reluctances in accepting your will, deliver me, Jesus. From anxiety about the future, deliver me, Jesus. From resentment or excessive preoccupation with the past, deliver me, Jesus. From restless self-seeking in the present moment, deliver me, Jesus. From disbelief in your love and presence, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being asked to give more than I have, deliver me, Jesus. From the belief that my life has no meaning or worth, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of what love demands, deliver me, Jesus. From discouragement, deliver me, Jesus. That you are continually holding me, sustaining me, loving me. 
Jesus, I trust in you. That your love goes deeper than my sins and failings and transforms me. Jesus, I trust in you. That not knowing what tomorrow brings is an invitation to lean on you. Jesus, I trust in you. That you are with me in my suffering. Jesus, I trust in you. That my suffering, united to your own, will bear fruit in this life and the next. Jesus, I trust in you. That you will not leave me orphan. That you are present in your church. Jesus, I trust in you. That your plan is better than anything else. Jesus, I trust in you. That you always hear me and in your goodness always respond to me. Jesus, I trust in you. That you give me the grace to accept forgiveness and to forgive others. Jesus, I trust in you. That you give me all the strength I need for what is asked. Jesus, I trust in you. That my life is a gift. Jesus, I trust in you. That you will teach me to trust you. Jesus, I trust in you. That you are my Lord and my God. Jesus, I trust in you. That I am your beloved one. Jesus, I trust in you.